that's why I'm delighted that uh, the ATBG is already in action so that we can uh, plan for the uh, future. And of course, uh, climate change and it, tackling it actually offers a, a route out of uh, the COVID-19 um, economic crisis that we're going to have in the, in the future. We have uh, a top speakers list. I'll introduce those as we go along. But I'd particularly like to thank our sponsors, who are Atkins, um, WSP, National Grid, Barrett Developments, uh, EDF and Centrica. So thanks to them for making this possible. Now, there, there's a number of questions that we want to ask, and uh, I think slides are going to put up for here on the sort of questions that we're looking at. And uh, it's going to be uh, a pretty, uh, a lot of questions there. So I'm just going to say sort of things they are quickly. Um, they are basically how we accelerate our transition into net zero. They're around uh, what the role nuclear can play. Uh, what about hydrogen? Car car carbon capture and usage as well as uh, storage, the risks and opportunities uh, that there are, flexible demand, something that uh, we only really started talking about a few years ago and is very young in terms of this issue, in terms of uh, demand as well as supply management, and of course a long-term funding framework as well and how that can uh, change, particularly now we no longer have institutions like the European Investment uh, Bank. So a lot of questions there and I know we've already had some that have come in from uh, participants and we'll try to get as many of those in as uh, possible. Let's just go through some of the uh, operations uh, for today. Um, first of all, can I just say it's going to be a uh, very tight uh, timing because we have uh, a good uh, panel of speakers. We have uh, Energy Minister Kwasi Kwarteng, Kwarteng um, meeting us and uh, coming in at about uh, uh, five o'clock. I'm going to try to get as many questions as I can, in, but what I would say is for those of you that uh, don't get your questions through, we will make a note of them, put them, uh, raise your hand, use the hand raising function to bring my attention to any other questions, but also if you want to uh, use the, um, the chat function also to uh, communicate uh, questions as well, and if possible say who you'd like them directed at uh, as, as, as well. But perhaps I could ask both not just uh, our contributors, our panelists, but also our questioners to keep their questions fairly tight uh, and, uh, and the answers as well, so we can get as much participation as possible. But if you have other things that you want to uh, bring to the party, please email us and, uh, or contact us because uh, we'll put that in as evidence uh, after, the, uh, after the session. The session is being recorded. I uh, hope that's okay with all of you. And uh, can I just remind you, as we all know, we're all used to Zoom and Teams conferences these days, but if you can, uh, please um, uh, mute yourself when you're not uh, participating, and I'll try to do the same uh, as well. Okay, I think that pretty well gets through all the, uh, all the introductions. But uh, so let's start with the, uh, the real meat of the meeting. And, uh, First of all, we have decarbonisation of power and industry in context. And I'm really, really pleased that uh, we've managed to uh, have uh, two members of uh, the Climate Change uh, Committee operation, which is really the organisation since uh, the Climate Change Act of 2008 that has really driven uh, our approach to uh, climate change, Dr. Rebecca Heaton and Professor Keith Bell. So I'm going to hand over to both of you and uh, look forward to your presentation. Over to you. Hi, well, um, I'm going to start and then, and just doing a little bit of an introduction as to what Net Zero is. Then I'm going to hand over to Keith, my fellow Climate Change Commissioner, who is our absolute um, expert on industry and leads a lot of the industry work for the CCC. So I'm, I'll just give quite a brief overview. I'm sure you know all this, but it's just to recap. Um, I just want to say also, it's really great and good news that we've got this APPG on net zero. Um, so very good. And to have this focus on industry, which has long been an area we felt needed a bit more focus from, from within the CCC. So first of all, um, just to remind us of what net zero was, so in light of the Paris Agreement, the government asked us at the CCC um, when and what a new target might look like for the UK. And the Paris Agreement was somewhat vague. It talked about well below two degrees and 
best efforts to 1.5 degrees. And what we did as a committee was um, we looked at the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, which you would need to limit it to well below two and move towards 1.5. We also thought a lot about the UK's um, views on this and historical emissions from the UK. So the UK wants to be a leader, but historically we've been responsible for a lot of emissions um, because of us being the, the, the birthplace of the industrial um, revolution. Oh gosh, I've just gone on a slide. Hang on. Um, so um, from that, we also had to look at what credible scenarios we might, uh, we, we could generate to actually um, get to net zero. And we came up, as we all know, um, with a recommendation to government, which has been legislated, which was that we should target net zero greenhouse gas emissions in the UK by 2050, Scotland by 2045, and Wales actually only 95% by 2050. And that's predominantly because of the heavy industry in Wales and the lack of offshore storage for bioenergy with carbon capture and storage or direct air capture and storage to offset those um, emissions. And what's happening since then is um, the Treasury are doing a review. And this is really not how much, but more importantly, who should bear the brunt of those costs and where should those costs fall? And we're increasingly seeing the need to um, think about the just transition and how we fund this as much as what the costs are of it. So if we move to the next slide, I'll quickly recap something which I think you all know that we set carbon budgets. So how do we get to 2050? Well, we, we cut it down into these bite-sized five-year carbon budgets. So far, five of these have been legislated up to 2033. And we're working on the sixth carbon budget, which is for 2033 to 2037. And we should be producing that by the end of the year. This is a pretty big piece of work for us. Firstly, the last carbon budget, carbon budget five, didn't actually have net zero. It was only to 80% reduction of CO2 emissions, not zero. So that's quite a change. So expect to see a bit of a drop um, because of that change in the, in the goalpost, as it were. Um, it's also, we think will be one of the first times an industrialised country has really set out the roadmap to 2050, because basically by the time you've got to 2037, if you haven't got your major infrastructure changes in place and your major decisions about how you're going to do this, it's going to be too late. So this is pretty a big piece of work for us. We also, though, um, hold the government's feet to the fire by using um, producing annual progress reports, and we're working on one of those at the moment, and that will come out um, this summer. So if we move on to the next slide, just want to talk about the elephant in the room here, which is, of course, um, COVID-19. We've recently written to Boris and to the First Ministers of Scotland and Wales with our thoughts about how climate change is impacted um, and what we do next. And the overriding message is nothing has changed for climate change. Um, you know, it's still there. We still have legally binding targets. But what we've tried to do is really find that sweet spot where um, the green recovery, as people are calling it, so that the sort of opportunities for recovery from COVID also supports climate change. So we really try to highlight what those might be. And we've grouped them into six principles. So first of all, pretty obvious, really using climate investments um, to support economic recovery and jobs. And we've looked, found, highlighted several examples. There's several things we need to do to meet net zero, which have really large amounts of labor. So that could be home insulation, um, tree planting, um, um, heat pumps. And these are things which, which are really labor intensive. So we, we've said there perhaps could be some opportunities there. Behavioral change. I mean, we're all hearing about people walking more and cycling more and we're seeing some really positive policies in that place. Are those behaviours going to stay? We think it's just too early to know. So in terms of the context, context of industry emissions, we still need to get those down. And I don't think this change that we're seeing is necessarily going to be large enough or, or indeed permanent enough, but we're hopeful there might be something there. So we're keeping a really close eye on that. Um, thirdly, this, this wider resilience deficit. So I think We've shown the need for planning with, with coronavirus. Um, I think there's some examples there as to what we should be doing um, across all different government departments on tackling climate change. Fairness, as I've mentioned again, is a core principle, um, particularly because again with coronavirus, it's again the lower income people who are mostly impacted. That's also true with climate change. Um, 
I see I'm being moved on. So I'm, I'll talk about this slide. So we were just saying also make sure recovery does not lock in greenhouse gas emissions from, um, and also to strengthen incentives to reduce emissions when we're looking at new tax regimes, because clearly the whole tax regime will be changed after this. So what can we do to incentivize reduction emissions, um, emission reductions whilst we're doing that. So if I move on to the next slide to show a little bit about where, where does industry fit into this. So um, the government has done, has done very well in terms of absolute um, numbers or rather the UK has done rather well um, so far. What we've been really lacking is policies for the future. So our strong message to the government for the last few years and will be again in this annual report is that we need some very strong uh, long-term policies. If this was a tick box of policies, this chart, there would be a lot of crosses. It's not, it's, an, it's, a, it's a, a graph of CO2 emissions and it shows that the, so far most of the heavy lifting has been done in the power sector. The industry sector has seen a reduction, but um, that's been due less to um, decarbonisation and more to closures. So we need to really think about how we can actually decarbonise, carry on producing, but do it in a much more greenhouse gas effective manner. Um, I think as we're, we're short on time, rather than covering off the other, um, the other sectors, I will pass over to Keith to talk us a little bit more in detail about that, the issue around industry. Keith, over to you. Keith, you're muted. Crumbs, yes, I, I've been so well behaved in muting myself. We're all done with getting into this habit now. Um, yeah, so just to sort of dig into the industry sector a little bit and to recognise that it's not just one sector, actually, it's quite a diverse picture. And a fair number of the emissions to date have come from uh, manufacturing processes from fossil fuel production and, and so on, uh, various kind of intensive processes like, like the, the manufacture of cement and lime. So whatever actions we're taking for the future have got to recognise that actually there's a diversity of things in there. And uh, say in construction, part of it will be about reducing the amount of materials that are used in buildings, as well as the way in which we manufacture those materials. So even though we've achieved a fair bit, especially in the power sector, uh, and not so much in the industry sector, we've got to do a hell of a lot more to get to 2050. So the two scenarios shown here, the core one was what was produced to get towards an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. The further ambition one takes those actions further, but even that doesn't get quite to net zero. We need to go you know, beyond that as well. And what you can see on the bottom right corner of that slide is the uh, further action, you know, dramatic reductions. And the other important thing about this, I think, is it has to happen across all sectors. No sector escapes, if you like, from having to play its part in getting towards an overall UK net zero position. So we look maybe back at the electricity sector, the power sector, which, as Becky said earlier, has to date done kind of the heavy lifting, but it's still got to be a hell of a lot more reduction. So out to 2050, a further reduction, in fact, almost completely eliminating emissions from that sector. But that's against the background of potentially doubling the demand for electrical energy. So, you know, you can see there's a massive transformation is still required there. But exactly how much is required is still somewhat uncertain. One of the big variables there is how much use we're going to make of hydrogen. And that in turn depends on a number of different sectors. Uh, so, you know, how much hydrogen will be used in, in industry in terms of high intensity heat, how much for transport, it, you know, for example, for heavy goods vehicles, which don't really seem suitable for, uh, for batteries, and how much for uh, space heating in, in buildings. So what that chart also shows is the need for different kinds of, of electricity generation, the sources of electrical energy. Uh, and one of the things it shows there is potentially a need for firm power. So what does that mean? Well, it kind of means something that you can rely on that can be scheduled, that has an output that can be kind of maintained over, you know, a number of hours, certainly a number of days. But also because we should be making much more use of, of renewables, which are highly variable, there's also a need for flexible plant that can fill in the gaps. There's a question I think now, which is you know, seeing in the last week or two about whether firm power also needs to be flexible. So we've had something uh, you know, announced just last week 
of National Grid signing a contract with EDF Energy to be able to reduce the output from Sizewell B power station. So one of the big imponderables here is what are the right me market mechanisms to deliver the right mix of facilities with the right capabilities. I mentioned already there's a, quite a bit of uncertainty about hydrogen uh, and certainly to unlock that potential for hydrogen and its flexibility about being stored and be able to transport it from one place to another the cheapest way of manufacturing it at the moment would seem to be via steam methane reformation or auto, auto thermal reformation but though both you know using methane as a feedstock but both of those processes depend on carbon capture and storage in order to have minimal carbon emissions so that gives another illustration of a kind of cross-sectoral dependency there and in terms of ccs a sort of infrastructure that doesn't yet exist so just my last kind of point before i hand over to some bit of detail around some of the challenges and further electrification mentioned already you know kind of what get, getting the right combination of capabilities financial mechanisms potentially still required to the development of renewables you know the scale of investment that is needed over the next 30 years uh, the networks as a facilitator of the different resources how much is still needed and how much can you reduce that need for network investment through what we've been generally calling flexibility I think there are some uh, particular engineering challenges around operation of the system and how those challenges are going to be addressed and I mentioned already you know this question about what does base load or firm power really mean okay I'll stop there and uh, hand over to uh, to others thanks very much uh, Keith and uh, thanks uh, Rebecca um, yeah Rebecca policies for the future absolutely we, we need those and I hope that's going to be a core cool part of the all party groups uh, work uh, as we all know uh, we even when at a 80% target, we're not yet at uh, meeting fourth and fifth carbon budget, so we've got a lot to do there. And Keith, yes, firm power, yeah, interesting as you say around the uh, potential negotiations around the nuclear industry there. But hydrogen, um, yeah, it's a big, big, big question that whole heating uh, and cooling uh, system and part of the transport system and that fact that it's uh, methane rather than electrolysis is the normal way to do it. So some 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 big challenges there. So let's uh, actually find out some answers or at least some uh, direction uh, towards those from our industry uh, panel. Uh, we have uh, Dr. David Cole from, uh, from Atkins on the nuclear and power market uh, side, Paul Spence from EDF and uh, Natasha Mamoudian uh, from Centrica. So I'm gonna ask uh, um, David Cole, uh, Dr. David Cole, first of all, to start us off. Uh, David, are you there? Hopefully. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yep, absolutely. Excellent. So my name is Dave Cole. I'm director of Atkins Power Business in UK and Europe. And um, we've been looking at the net zero system and the engineering and build of it as a study we carried out last year. Uh, and there are more reports online if you want to look at this in detail of what we did. So our approach was pretty straightforward. We looked at system complexity and interdependency, which is already increasing and does so massively in a net zero system. We looked at the engineering of it. What are the technologies? Can they be used today? And we looked at what are the technical and commercial risks associated with each of those components of a net zero system that then interact. If you can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, so if we focus on the power system, and as uh, Professor Bell already highlighted, whilst power's done some of the heavy lifting, there's actually still quite a lot to do if we need a much bigger system and we've got to replace a lot of the system we've already got. So this is a schematic of how that system might actually look, and you can get a bit of a feel for where we've identified some of the technical and commercial risk behind each of those systems. And the fact is in this future system, and this is based on the CCC net zero report that came out last year, which was a great scenario. There's quite a lot to do around the different uh, factors. We're still reliant on natural gas and carbon. So we end up with a system, a power system that goes through quite a lot of radical change. Uh, firm power drops significantly from what we're used to around 80% to a much lower percentage. And the scenario you can see here on the right even has a good dose of nuclear in beyond some of the current modeling. So it's even slightly less than that. But we, our consumption is doubling, our peak demand may triple, and our installed capacity needs to be very high as well to be able to cope with that. So we're looking at a massive change that we're running through. Next slide, please. If we look into the past and thinking in terms of build rate, 
oh, for conventional power generation of the last 40 years, we have never put in the UK on the bars anything higher than five to six gigawatts. If you start to add up the run rate we need for the kind of system we're talking about under the different scenarios, you're looking at between on average nine to 12 gigawatts build rate per annum to try and recreate that system. And that's obviously a system where we're running to keep up with what's being switched off. If you look across interconnected Europe, for example, by 2023, we will lose 30 gigawatts of firm power, which Professor Bell has already described what that could mean to us. In that context, it means coal power stations, gas power stations, and nuclear power stations. So the ones that we can rely on. So complex system, then how did you pick the right things? We're used to picking on price, a price called levelized cost of electricity. As our system gets more complicated, that becomes a harder thing to compare on a like-for-like -like basis. So we need to start to think about a good system way of comparing the cost of the different components, the cost of renewables combined with system balancing and storage, the cost of gas with potentially how much CCS might cost, carbon capture and storage, and the cost of nuclear with the associated long build rates and financing challenges. So there's some real interesting comparisons for us to make there. Um, I will, next slide please. Thank you. Just to conclude, we, we thought net zero is highly achievable, but there's a massive technical risk associated with it in terms of what we need to do, and the system is becoming incredibly complex. The scale of the change in build rate does not allow for prevarication. We need to be building the system we need now and at great pace, as hopefully we've uh, talked about through this session. We can't really wait now for new technology or the promise of not new technology, such as things we talked about how we might use hydrogen electrolysis more, but uh, we shouldn't rely on it now, but we shouldn't preclude it from future systems. And the engineering and building of a net zero system does present for us, as uh, my other speakers mentioned, a great opportunity for a route to green recovery. So to summarize in hopefully approximately five minutes, in the 30 years to reach net zero, in that time, we have to replace most of our existing generating assets. They will need to be replaced. We need to build more again to meet a doubling or tripling of demand. And we need to create some totally new systems, such as a carbon capture infrastructure from nothing to say 180 million tons a year, a new hydrogen infrastructure, perhaps for heating and transportation, as well as energy storage, and an energy storage system. We have four gigawatts today. We probably need to go to somewhere around 30 gigawatts for the time of type of system we're going to have. So it's a massive challenge. It's extremely exciting. And uh, it's a great thing to be involved in as an industry. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, David. That's uh, quite a challenge uh, that you've uh, given us uh, there. And actually, the thing that struck me particularly looking at that graph of investment by years is how lumpy that investment was in the past. And now the challenge is we have to do it every year, not just uh, a couple of years every decade. So, so thanks very much in, indeed for that. And uh, next, uh, well, we have uh, Paul Spence from EDF. Over to you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Lord Everson. I just check you can hear me. Yep. Excellent. Good. Well, thank you. Um, my uh, title is Director of Strategy and Corporate Affairs for EDF in the UK. And just by brief introduction to EDF, we're the UK's largest producer of low carbon electricity today. About 30 wind farms, eight nuclear power stations, one gas station, one coal station, and uh, we also have the UK's largest uh, battery storage facility that we operate, as well as uh, a large electric vehicle um, uh, charging infrastructure that we're responsible for. Um, and our investment in this in infrastructure is one of the ways we're helping the country get to, to net zero. To get to net zero, I mean, just to oversimplify the sophisticated work by the Committee on Climate Change, we need to double the amount of electricity that we provide. We need to change out fossil fuels in our cars, in our homes, so replacing our gas boilers with heat pumps and also in industry. And within that, we need to quadruple the amount of that electricity that is low carbon, so four times as much low carbon electricity as is produced today. And to get there, 
we need to do that with a mix of as much renewables as we possibly can but also i mean as some of the previous speakers have talked about we need firm low carbon generation in that mix something that's reliably there when when we need it all the time so not dependent on the weather not dependent on the time of day but produced all all year round whatever the weather and so it, uh, if we can emily go to the next slide please thank you very much so you know it's a it's a challenge um and the challenge of getting the right amount of power gets more important as the proportion of renewables on the grid goes but yeah, you know, a renewables and nuclear system offers a low carbon system where you don't have to worry or we don't have to collectively worry about the cost of intermittency to consumers and we can look to other countries so particularly in western europe to france and to sweden both of whom have that mix of renewables and nuclear and both of whom moved pretty quickly over the course of about a decade a little bit longer than that to meet the challenge of delivering that in a programmatic and well-managed way. So if we go on to the next slide, um, I think just, just to um, perhaps reiterate uh, the point that David was making, as well as new infrastructure to meet rising demand, a decent chunk of the UK's existing electricity infrastructure is going to re retire over the course of the next decade so by 2035 we need to have built to re replace the retiring nuclear stations as they come to the end of their lives and also to replace the coal stations of, that have come to the end of their lives so there is a challenge to keep the lights on keep building but also to make sure that what we build is low carbon um, as a company, my company EDF is building Hinkley Point in Somerset. Uh, we're well into the construction of that project, and that's going to meet enough need in, or produce enough electricity for 7% of UK need. And it's also already giving a massive employment and supply chain boost in the South West, West well on its way to creating 25,000 jobs, which is the number that we estimate over the um, construction of uh, the whole uh, station and we think that there's a very strong case to take that start that we've made at Hinkley Point and to look to build further new nuclear particularly at Sizewell C in Suffolk which um, you know we can take the same design the same workforce and reduce the cost of building the next station by copying and by doing what's been done ex extremely well already in the offshore wind industry um, so you know, as we look to exit um, the covid crisis infrastructure offers an opportunity to reduce our dependence on fossil and nuclear and renewables and energy efficiency are all parts of what we think is needed i'll stop there okay thanks uh, very much uh, indeed yeah some some uh, interesting uh, thoughts there but that yes uh, that we're going to have to replace the whole power system pretty well is is something that's uh, going to be uh, quite challenging as we've uh, seen in both those presentations we're going to then move over to uh, Centrica and Natasha Mamoudian. Natasha, I think uh, I can, before, just before you start, can I just tell everybody, of course, that we do have uh, two hashtags uh, which people can use. One is net zero APPG and the other one is green recovery. So Natasha, over to you. Thank you, Lord Teverson. I just want to check everyone can hear me. Yep. Excellent, wonderful. So first of all, um, thanks for the introduction and also thank you so far to the speakers. They've been some really interesting presentations. So um, I'll introduce myself briefly. I'm Natasha, I'm one of Centrica's senior public affairs managers. Um, for those of you who don't know, Centrica is a parent company for, uh, for parent company of British Gas. Uh, we also work with a wide, wide range of customers, including the public sector um, to reduce op and optimize energy use. 
We also are work on installing energy efficiency technology and also electric vehicle infrastructure. So I'm really delighted to share some thoughts with you on this challenge of net zero, but in particular system flexibility is where I'll focus today. So um, as we all know, we're committed to meeting, to, net, to meeting net zero, and this is something that Centrica is really supportive of. Um, we know that we're gonna have to take a number of actions across the economy, as seen in the CCC presentation earlier, and that's no mean feat. Um, of particular interest to Centrica is renewables, transport, and also heat. And in order to kind of meet the, the challenge in, is challenges in those areas, we're going to have to take a number of actions. So first, if we look at renewables, um, we believe that around 150 gigawatts of renewable generation will be needed by 2050. And alongside that, we'll need optimization for that as well. If we look at, at road transport, uh, we will need to see kind of mass uptake of electric vehicles. Uh, this is why we very much welcome the government's consultation on the earlier phase out date for the internal combustion engine. And of course, alongside this, we acknowledge the need for other drivetrains for um, HGVs, for example, that, that are much more difficult to electrify. And perhaps there's a role there for gas. Um, then turning to look at heat. So clearly there will be some level of electrification need, needed there. And we believe that's probably upwards of 20% of all heat demand that will be needed to be electrified by 2050. And in the meantime, we're seeing use of hybrid heat pumps um, that can be particularly useful for industrial settings uh, that need high grade heat. So we're, we're working with some customers on that as well. So as we move to, to uh, net zero, I think we all know that the way that power is generated and used across these particular sectors is going to really radically change. And that includes the mass generation of hydrogen and deployment of CCS that people have already touched upon. Um, moving on to think about the kind of existing markets and regulatory models, we're also going to need some change there. And we all know that the, the system was designed for a kind of large centrally connected fossil generation. And that also followed demand, as we saw before. And, you know, if we stick with that model to meet net zero, it will entail building out more central generation and reinforcing networks uh, to, to meet this demand. But this, in our view, is, is, is no longer the only option. And instead, you know, we very much agree with with uh, the comments earlier around flexibility from the CCC and um, the fact that we need to start looking at managing our demand in a smart and flexible manner and and how we kind of manage that generation and balance it. So so for us, this means shifting when the energy is used, but also optimizing um, and balancing that power demand. And this increasingly is something which will be needed at a local level, as we see uptake of, of heat pumps and EVs, where we'll see challenges in, in the local network. So from our own modeling, uh, it's suggesting that there's a need for upwards of, of 70 gigawatts of flexibility and to, to support the power system cost effectively. And in terms of flexibility, we're talking about things such as storage, demand management, as well as transmission level and distribution level flexible capacity. Um, in addition to deploying more renewables, as we've touched upon before, we know we need to decarbonize heat and transport, and that's going to require a level of electrification that we don't see today. Luckily, we know that kind of overall electricity generation can be met. Um, but those new loads we talked about from heat and vehicles will create those local balancing needs. So I'm sure many of you are really familiar with the figures of, the, of saving the consumer 17 to 40 billion by 2050 by use of a flexible system. We know that Imperial College and the Carbon Trust have recently announced updating this study into the value of flexibility and we really look forward to, to seeing this. So we think that increasing flexibility within our system makes a lot of sense to most, um, but we don't believe that the current system is, is going to deliver on this flexibility for a number of reasons. And these include um, the focus at the moment of existing markets being on system flexibility at national scale. The second one is that flexibility isn't valued properly within the energy system and it, therefore it's, it's quite difficult to generate revenue. And then the last one is that we believe that there's probably more need for an incentive to use uh, flexibility over reinforcement. Um, in practice, what, what this really means is that there will need to be changes in policy and regulation uh, to deliver flexibility and contribute to meeting at zero at least cost. And I think it's worth highlighting two items. So the first one is that we believe that a really key component to deliver uh, to deliver flexibility is that we have fully functioning flexibility markets to manage local issues and we think that we'll need these by 2023 
An example of what these could look like is demonstrated uh, by our Cornwall Local Energy Market project and that will be coming to a close at the end of this year. It's, it's currently in train at the moment. Uh, the second item, and, and this is something which uh, would be nice to share with the Minister when he joins us, is that we believe that the energy white paper will be absolutely key for setting the direction for net zero and identifying key enablers. Uh, we see flexibility as an absolutely key enabler. Um, obviously alongside many many other items which are required that people have touched on earlier and um, as such we believe the government should use the white paper to set a policy objective for the deployment of flexibility to meet net zero and therefore sending a very strong signal to the market and investors on this front and enabling the other various interventions that will flow from there. Uh, just to finish, I think it's really worth mentioning that um, as a company we're very supportive of building back better post uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we, alongside many others, believe that it's really important to continue the momentum that we had um, on tackling climate change prior to the outbreak. Uh, so once we, you know, once we return to a level of normality, we'll look forward to working with people. But in the meantime, our thoughts are very much with all those who have been affected so far. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much indeed, uh, Natasha. I was uh, delighted you mentioned Cornwall, where I'm sitting at the minute, and what's going on down there and what you're doing down there, which is all good news. And uh, actually, demand side management you mentioned as well. But an interesting comment that flexibility is not valued at the moment. I think that's something perhaps we should, uh, I'd quite like to take away. And yes, on transport, then the Department of Transport has uh, put out a, a pretty good um, consultation, uh, not just around electric vehicles, but more broadly, public transport and everything. So. So that's uh, good news that the Department of Transport is getting itself into, uh, into gear, uh, literally. Um, I'm going to uh, open the, the debate really by bringing in uh, some parliamentarians, as is the uh, tradition on all party groups. And uh, I, we, we have uh, Dr. Alan Whitehead uh, with us, who's Shadow Minister for Green Deal and Energy. And Alan's always someone when I'm in these meetings who always knows more than anybody else about all of this and uh, has been a great campaigner in terms of these issues. So, Alan, would you like to come in and perhaps uh, start us off on the debate? Uh, I'm now unmuted. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Robin. Uh, I have listened carefully to the uh, debate so far uh, and the things that are um, a, I think a, a given and a common is just how much more we are going to have to replace as far as generation is concerned in terms of how much is going off stream, um, what we will need for increased uh, demand in the future and how we're likely to meet that. But uh, what I think is not has not entirely gone into the debate and and this is um i think that one of natasha's uh key points is how what that increased demand what, what that increased demand looks like in total and how what we are doing in various ways of um decarbonizing different aspects of energy then that total demand is going to be uh a greater or a lesser amount so the decisions that we make and we'll have to make very shortly about um, how we uh, really get stuck into uh, decarbonizing heat uh, could go one of several ways it could either go uh, into a fully electrification of heat uh, it could go into a a uh, various solutions, various horses for various courses for solutions. It could go uh, for a, a national change to hydrogen, for example. Um, it could go to joint um, uh, heat networks, uh, injection, biomethane, hydrogen islands, and various other ways of doing it. But as soon as you go into that particular area, then the question of how much generation we're going to need in terms of the relative electrification of heat becomes an important question uh, because uh, that's that's the point at which we we say you know do we need to um, uh, as uh, um, has been suggested 
um, have to go for you know nine, eleven gigawatts a year each year, or do we have um, different ways of, of of combining to reduce that that total amount of bill per year? We've also got the question coming in of th th three other things I would just put into <coughs> uh, in terms of um, how that particular stark figure may be addressed. The first one is indeed Natasha's point about flexibility and how um, the, the operation of, this, uh, of the system at a, on a much smarter basis with consumer uh, cooperation and the localization of a lot of, uh, uh, of energy uh, arrangements uh, can actually have a, a real impact in, in terms of total demand and the likely national um, picture that's going to result. Secondly, the extent to which we can actually, through um, interconnection and other forms of obtaining low carbon power from elsewhere, um, have an effect on the total amount we need to build in the UK, and particularly got in mind things like um, uh, uh, Icelandic interconnector, which actually would uh, is would effectively be a captured interconnector, i.e., they wouldn't be able to interconnect. They wouldn't be able to go anywhere else with the power that they produce, uh, which is low carbon, and would have to come to us. And there are other schemes uh, for solar concentration and solar power coming uh, elsewhere via DC cables uh, into the UK. So there's a there's a I think a question mark uh, there. And and then, I, I need to, yeah, yeah, and then I was just going to say the final thing I, I, I want to say is the question of, uh, of how energy efficiency points to that total generation and whether uh, in terms of the, the sort of uh, discussion that's going on in terms of energy efficiency in our homes and, uh, and offices to, to reduce demand considerably or can have a substantial hand in reducing that overall amount that we need to put into the process. And I think those are the sort of crucial points to sort of quest, put question marks against some of the projections that have been made recently or in the past about just what amount we've got to climb in generation and how that is then going to affect um, what we do in terms of getting to, to net zero overall. So those are my immediate, immediate thoughts just to put in the pot and I'd be interested um, to hear from panelists about whether any or all of those resonate in terms of the overall debate, and if so, to what extent. Okay, thanks very much, Alan. I've got to, we're a hob house, and then perhaps bring Larry Whitty in as well. Weira, what uh, comments from you? Well, thank you very much um, for your presentations. Um, obviously, you've done some very detailed research, and, and I, I, I do believe to, to know exactly where we are now um, and setting out a roadmap where we need to be is, is obviously very useful um, but obviously we still have time to debate whether really um, the proposals that have been coming forward from the different industry leaders and of course you know fair enough you're doing certain things and um, you think you're doing the right thing and uh, that's the way forward but I personally uh, wonder um, the assumption um, uh, that green hydrogen is not something that should be really part of um, the push forward because um, it's a new technology or new technology where we don't really know how that's going to work out and so on and so forth. I would challenge that. Um, I think if we go to hydrogen, and I do believe um, very much that hydrogen uh, will have to probably pay a very significant role um, in, in, in our future for particularly um, heating our homes. Um, and, you know, I've been listening to interesting discussions about how one could actually relatively easily change systems and boilers um, towards um, a, a heating solution that's based on hydrogen but also of course um, within the transport sector hydrogen is a, is a very interesting option possibly not not for for every vehicles but uh, you, the, the, the heavier vehicles it becomes quite obvious is difficult difficult to do with electricity and batteries so hydrogen also within the transport system but um, and, and and that means a, a, a very high degree of, of, of hydrogen, fair enough. Um, but I don't believe we should um, uh, uh, continue or ultimately look into the future as a continuation of um, uh, using, using um, natural gas and then um, through a process sort of extract the hydrogen. But we should do it via um, uh, renewable energy 
um, in electrolysis. Um, we as a country are actually very, very lucky. Uh, we can overproduce renewables if, if you wish. We've got um, a successful offshore, offshore wind, uh, wind sector. Uh, we can do a lot more about um, hydropower probably. If we looked into the future, yes, fair enough. That is about uh, uh, bringing on some changes very quickly, radically. But um, I think we shouldn't just um, say, say so quickly, oh, this is not possible. Uh, let's just throw um, nuclear into the mix uh, and let's, uh, yeah, let's do hydrogen, but with, uh, with continuing to extract natural gas. I don't think that, that the net zero future should look like that. Thanks, Vera. Um, and uh, Larry Whitty, Lord Whitty. Larry, you there? But I am here. No. Yes, I'm okay. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Absolutely. Yep. Um, two broad questions. One, there are some pretty substantial investment, strategic investment decisions which have to be taken, which can only make get the issue of the future of uh, domestic heating. Uh, and in particular, the system that we use and where we can uh, use hydrogen, and if so, how we produce that hydrogen, whether we're going to get green hydrogen or whether we're going to um, uh, continue to rely on uh, hydrogen. Uh, those decisions have to be taken much earlier in strategic terms than uh, actually building the plant. We've had a long delay on other parts of the system. Like as it is, but we actually still do not have anything um, significant operating within the system. Uh, so, how are those key decisions to be taken? And in a sense, who is also going to pay for them? Uh, and if the answer is this generation of consumers, then my second point is um, uh, how are we to ensure? that those who use the energy system, whether they're a businesses, industry or consumers, recognize that they're going to have to pay more for it uh, and to be more energy efficient themselves in the use of it um, in the relatively near, ter near term, because talking for 2050 actually turns a lot of people off. Um, it's the decisions to get to 2050 that have to be made made and implemented by 2030 uh, that really require a lot of political will as well as industrial and investment commitment. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Larry. Can I, you, you disappeared a little bit during part of those. So there was a question about the, uh, the, the heating system and, and hydrogen and who pays. And I think there was something in the middle there that maybe some of us missed slightly. Um, was there, have I left anything out? Well, uh, in the middle, I was saying that the previous uh, strategic decisions, uh, the, the need for them has been recognised quite early on, but uh, the investment hasn't actually taken place. That's and great. I was using CCS as, a, as an example of that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, perhaps um, let, let's, we've got uh, hopefully 10 minutes till uh, the, till we have uh, Kwasi Kwasan speak to us. Um, perhaps I could, uh, we could finish this, then we'll come back to everybody else and they'll keep the um, parliamentarians uh, in, in the background on the second round after the minister. So um, perhaps I could ask uh, either Rebecca or Keith from the Climate Change Committee to particularly come back on this thing of how or how confident we are in the total um, power generation that we need given all the variables. Perhaps is that, uh, could one of you come back on that first? Yeah, I can offer something on that. I mean, I think out to 2050 there's an uncertainty and I think that is linked in as something a few of us have discussed about the extent to which hydrogen is going to be part of the future energy system. I think it's likely to be some part but whether it you know covers the whole country for example is another is another matter. You know there are various clusters that seem to be under development or at least being explored in terms of their technical and financial viability right now in particular locations that could sort of seed the development of the industry. What I think we can be certain about, and I think something that Lord Whitty brought up just now is really important in this respect, is that we need to massively ramp up the capacity of 
low carbon generation in the next 10 years. So, you know, it's a kind of low regrets thing. The kind of range of uncertainty for 2050 doesn't mean that we haven't got a lot to do. You know, even at the lower end of that range, there's still a massive scaling up to be done. We need to do that in the next, yeah, in the next 10 years. You know, I think a, a useful kind of reference point for that is the kind of, uh, you know, the targets for the development of offshore wind. You know, 30 gigawatts was talked about in the offshore wind sector deal. The Conservative Party manifesto talked about 40 gigawatts. You know, so that, that already is a massive scaling up. So, you know, we've got to do a lot in the next decade and we'll hopefully, if we do the right kind of research and analysis, we will resolve some of the uncertainties as we go along about the two decades that come after. Thanks uh, for, for that. Did, did you have any comment just quickly on interconnectors? Because uh, that's something where a number of those are being built at the moment. And uh, from a paucity, um, if everything goes right, we should have quite a few more. Iceland's a little bit maybe into the future, but... Uh, we have a, a, but, uh, but a possibility. Do you take that into consideration in what you look at? Internet, interconnectors are extremely important in providing some of that, well, a lot of that flexibility. You know, when we have surplus in a particular, in particular hours of uh, available low carbon power, in theory, we can export that and we have a de deficit, we can import to, to cover that deficit. That's, that's, you know, why interconnectors are being developed. The financial mechanisms under which they get developed, I think that's another question. In Britain, we've favoured merchant development, you know, private investment, earn their money back from, if you like, renting out the capacity on the interconnector. The more interconnection capacity you have, the lower the earnings per megawatt of capacity. So the further you go along, maybe there's a kind of a, you know, the, the financial attractiveness to merchant investors maybe starts to to, to drop a little bit. But certainly uh, a lot of the modelling that, that, that we've done and seen from others shows that if you can get the right kind of complementary interconnection, say between here and Norway, you know, and the Norwegians can save their water when it's windy here, and when it's not windy here, we can use their water, this kind of thing. But as we go through the 2020s, the kind of, yeah, the, the financial and commercial arrangements that drive them might need to be thought about again, I think. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Let's, um, perhaps I could go in a different order and bring the, Natasha in. Uh, uh, next um, on some of these questions. I mean, in terms of who pays, Centrica are at the front end, uh, like many of uh, of the consumer side, and uh, I've got a question about consumers coming up later, but uh, but uh, who pays and this whole area around hydrogen as, as well, Natasha? Uh, yeah, so um, consumer isn't my specialism, so I'm just going to caveat it with that. But I think in terms of just principles, so we are very much um, in favour of, of fairness when it when it comes to looking at how charges are spread. And I think that in terms of what we're doing, our regulatory team's working very closely with Ofgem um, on the next set of reforms. And so I think that will be actually quite a pivotal and important time for us. And, and so that's why the date of 2023 has been has been put out there because that really does um, look at a kind of next stage um, as as it does also with carbon budgets. So it seems like quite a pivotal date to make sure that we are on the right track um, moving towards whatever this new en energy system ends up looking like, and that too includes um, the the kind of network charging piece uh, and how that um, cost is spread out amongst consumers and industry alike. And what about this area of energy efficiency? It's always been one of my big things in that, uh, you know, the best thing around uh, decarbonisation is not to produce it in the first place. Uh, mm -hmm. you, obviously, uh, uh, energy companies have been involved in all sorts of schemes to do with energy efficiency. Is that something that's really going to happen for the future or is, is we've got to find all sorts of financial ways of doing that? So, so we, I think the, the answer to that is it really depends. So you're right, there have been a lot of schemes and I think that probably the thing to highlight is that energy efficiency is still going to be absolutely key and and we've we've done a lot of kind of studies recently looking at energy efficiency and what needs to be done in various sectors and actually we find that particularly in the public sector but also across many different industrial clusters such as you know food and drink or manufacturing of, of things such as cement etc that um, companies are really not investing in energy efficiency and you know, it could be for a number of reasons, but some of the easier technologies such as CHP, for example, will stack up quite easily. And so they will invest in those. And, and actually the positive thing about that is if you invest now, 
you can use that money to invest a few years down the line in things like solar and battery, et cetera. Um, but I think the key message on energy efficiencies is that to get to net zero, we have to do a lot of things. And energy efficiency really is the first, um, the first step. And if we can't even do that, the journey is going to be very difficult. So I think we all need to make a concerted effort to keep taking those steps and look at the low hanging fruit, make sure we're doing that and then moving on to the, the more difficult um, impactful areas. So, so for us, we think it's massively a journey that does start with energy efficiency and, and we still need to do a lot in that space. Okay. Thanks. I'm going to add there, so there's a, Becky, you made a good point on the chat, you know, about, um, this, you know, the, the 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 necessity of good insulation when we've got new, you know buildings using heat pumps. Indeed, yeah, no, that's that, that's that, that's 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 very useful. Um, so sorry, um, Robin, on that point, so yeah, I think it's worth mentioning the future home standards. So so when when that comes forward, we're we're hoping to see an earlier date on that to really push forward on, on measures on that front as well. Good. Thanks again, Natasha. Um, Dr. David Cole. Um, I, I could probably say a couple of quick things and you're probably up against it in terms of time just to be clear on what I presented we're not doing any modeling what we're doing is looking at models that people have put out there and trying to work out if you can build it or not and if you can build it in time and I think that's an important question that we keep asking ourselves um, I mean there's no nothing we put down precludes building a very high grid hydrogen system for example but there are questions that you need to look at and answer how much hydrogen do you need how much does it cost to produce it what volume and rate can you produce that hydrogen after you have enough for day or interseasonal demands and can you store it so there are some real really interesting questions i think the the bit around energy efficiency and what's the size of system we need is really interesting too uh, what we do know, obviously, is we want to decarbonise an awful lot of homes, 27 million, something like that, around, around the UK. And you can make some assumptions that some of that will be done by electricity. Transport, we want to electrify our cars. We will need to produce hydrogen or something for large goods vehicles and trains. At the moment, only 42% of our track is electrified. So as we increase the electrification of track, we will need more low carbon electricity. And, and just a, a thought I always have on interconnection, which is an interconnected Europe is great, an interconnected world is great, um, but we're all going through similar challenges at the same time. By 2023, seven countries in Europe will have dropped firm baseload power by, 20, uh, by 30 gigawatts, and by 2030, that will be 60 gigawatts. And we tend to have similar weather patterns. So it's important to look at the whole system and how it's gonna to work together. Okay, thanks. Can I can I come in on on just on on that that point? I, I just just to to reiterate. I mean, one of the merits I have is I'm part of uh, an international uh, electricity company. You know, we have operations in uh, the UK, in France, in Italy, in Belgium, and so I, I get to see the the discussions that are happening both side of an interconnector, and also the the dynamics on both sides, and and it's it's interesting to see how many times both ends of the interconnector reassure themselves that that interconnector provides um, further reliability and guarantees low carbon. But in a lot of cases, when you dig, the need is at the same point in time. So you know, back to David's point on that, or the source of that um, reliable power is high carbon reliable power and so you, what we mustn't do is just offshore our carbon production somewhere else by allowing germany for example to carry on um, burning lignite um, and you know the the other thing uh, particularly at the moment i think we should all be thinking about is that uh, we do need to be making choices that will drive job creation in the uk and as we think about energy efficiency which i absolutely agree is required as we think about building the right amount of flexible source um, flexibility in the system uh, and making sure we're producing the electrons that we will need for a future electric system we also think about the jobs that we're creating and make sure that uh, there are people there who can afford to consume and, and if i may the final thing i mean a lot of the focus in our discussion so far has been on the 27 million homes 
let's not forget that uh, about one third of the pre-COVID demand was domestic demand, two thirds was industrial and commercial. We need to make sure our factories and our offices are efficient and are supplied reliably with the electricity they're going to need for the future. Good, thanks very much indeed, uh, Paul. And I'm gonna bring that, uh, that part of the session uh, to the end. Uh, we now have uh, the minister with us. Um, and uh, Minister, can I, can I welcome you to the uh, All Party Group on, on Net Zero? Um, something I know that uh, you feel is a, a really important uh, topic for the, for the future. Um, we've had a, a, a good discussion around uh, industry. We've talked about uh, flexibility, future demand for uh, power, everything also from transport to demand side management, interconnectors, pretty well uh, everything. But uh, perhaps you'd like to uh, talk to us about uh, where you see the uh, government's uh, priorities and where we go for here, from here, certainly in terms of things like the white paper. Minister, over, over to you. If you're there. He was there on my list. I think he's just dropped out. Um, I don't know if you want to take another question whilst he logs okay, back in. Let's, let, yeah, let's do, let's do that then. Um, Guy Newey from uh, Energy Systems Catapult, uh, you, you put a question in beforehand, but you've also um, put in quite a, uh, a couple of comments on our chat about uh, flexibility and that side. Uh, Guy, would you like to um, make a, maybe a quick response and a, a question to the panel? Yeah, thanks, Robin. Um, just, just very, uh, very briefly. It's great to hear uh, people talking about flexibility and and the whole systems uh, approaches. Both the things that that we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about the the energy system catapult. I guess my question is: um, we've had a couple of, you know, we had the power cut of of August last year, and we had the kind of urgent co changes that were brought forward um, over the last uh, two weeks to deal with the low on the on the bank holiday, and I just you know, this is kind of highlighting some of the potential risks of, the, of a rapidly changing system. And, you know, you've talked about the opportunities of flexibility here. But I guess my question is, how should, how should the government and Ofgem approach the challenge of designing this new, this new power system? And is that kind of change coming much more rapidly than we, than we expected? I can have a go at that if you like, uh, Lord Tevison. Um, yeah, kind of in my day job as a power system engineer, if you like. But, um, I, you know, I, I think... I mentioned briefly in, in, in our presentation that I think there are serious engineering challenges and I agree with Guy that in some ways they, well, they've reached us sooner than the electricity system operator was perhaps expecting. I don't think they should have been expect, you know, kind of waiting around for it to happen. I think I, my honest opinion is uh, that collectively in the sector there should have been more proactive engagement with these issues to, to you know, do the research and get the, the, the market ancillary service mechanisms in place in advance. I think we've been uh, slow on the uptake collectively. Reasons why that is, I think, I feel is somewhat to do with the way the sector is organised, you know, the kind of um, partitioning of responsibilities between different parties. Now, you know, how you fix that is, is something that we can debate. And I see uh, the Minister has been able to join us. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I good, got good, good. I'm very pleased about that. I've had welcome. problems. Welcome to, to the meeting. We've had quite a, a broad discussion, but we're sure. very keen to uh, hear from you and uh, and how you see the future and maybe when the white paper might come out. Anyway, over to you, Minister. Okay. So the the, the <laughs> let's um, let's start with uh, the the broad context of where we're in. Um, I think that. The COVID-19 crisis has, has really focused our minds on uh, a couple of things. I mean, one is the uh, economic recovery, which we all want to see. And also on top of that, we, we, we have to have an economic recovery that is uh, clean and resilient. So the green aspect of that recovery is absolutely central. You know, tackling climate change, decarbonizing our economy remains, and I've just been on a call uh, with the industry players today, 
uh, th these remain absolutely front and center of our strategy. And I can't stress uh, to you in this forum enough the importance of the uh, net zero carbon legislation. I think that was hugely uh, significant. And we're continuing with our plans um, to decarbonize key sectors of the economy. We've got uh, a transport decarbonization plan, uh, which is uh, being led by uh, the transport department, our colleagues in, in that department. Um, and we're also having, uh, we're going to publish a, a heat and building strategy. And on top of all of that, uh, we've got an energy white paper coming out. Now, in terms of timing on that, um, and you asked that specifically, uh, my own view was we should have, um, we, it would have been good to have got this out last July when um, the new prime minister was appointed and the new government was formed. But you will remember that, um, you know, we had a summer recess and then we had the whole issue with the prorogation and then we had the election and then we had the budget. And then now we've had uh, COVID and this has pushed uh, the publication, I'm afraid, of the energy white paper uh, to a much later date than I would have liked. Now, I think that there's a chance we might get this just about before the summer recess, but, but that's, um, I, think, I think that's very hopeful, actually. I think there's a possibility, but I'm not sure we'll be able to land it there. And you will appreciate also that it's not just a matter of uh, me as an energy minister deciding when to publish the energy white paper. I mean, I've read two drafts of it already, um, and I think it's in a reasonable shape, but the ultimate decision on, on when to publish that uh, will be uh, will be number 10's decision and, and lies with the Prime Minister, which is quite right, given how centrally important it is to our net zero carbon uh, strategy. Um, what I would say is that um, I think there's a huge development, uh, even in the last year, on this. I mean, a year ago, we didn't have the net zero carbon legislation. Um, we didn't have a uh, cabinet uh, subcommittee on, on uh, climate change, which we, we has met, and I've been involved with that. We didn't have the uh, pot one uh, auction. Um, and, um, you know, we're making big strides in things like green finance, where the Treasury is actually considering the potential issuance of a UK sovereign green bond. That would be the first of its kind ever. And those of you who remember COP21 and the Paris uh, process will know that you know the the French launching their green sovereign bond a few months ahead of that COP 21 I think was a hugely significant step and that's something that I've been pushing within within government um, I know I see uh, Vera Hobhouse on the line she asked me a question before um, the uh, election I think it was in the House of Commons on green hydrogen and I can tell her that uh, hydrogen has been a massive focus uh, of mine and also of uh, the department as well. We, we all think uh, that it can play a strategically important role in a net zero energy system. And I think the main challenge, uh, as far as I'm concerned, with trying to um, kickstart the hydrogen economy is in working out how we can produce hydrogen in a clean way. And that green hydrogen has got a big part to pay, play in that. And of course, once we've deployed and successfully invested in CCUS, we can also have blue hydrogen as well. So um, I think, uh, you know, on the hydrogen production side, the government is actually very focused uh, on this. We've invested up to £121 million uh, in hydrogen innovation, which is a start. And also we have got a £100 million low carbon hydrogen production fund. So um, this is really something that we're very, very focused on. Now, alongside hydrogen, there's obviously the, the famous um, and long debated CCUS. Um, the, the, the Committee on Climate Change, as you all know, has stated that carbon capture and storage is a necessity. It's not just a, a, a nice to have. Um, and it's something that we've committed to twice. We've committed to it in the manifesto uh, ahead of the 2019 election. We also committed to it uh, in the budget. The Chancellor said that we would spend at least 800 million pounds to establish that. Uh, so I don't think that that we, is, a, is a promise that we can easily uh, uh, climb down from. And I fully expect to see uh, progress in that uh, this year as well. So um, just in terms of last um, sort of phase of my remarks before we go to question and answer, 
Um, you know, we've talked about hydrogen, we've talked about uh, CCUS, we've talked about, or I've talked about green finance. Um, the other piece in the jigsaw, there are a couple of others, but one I will mention now, is uh, heat, uh, heat and buildings. Um, I think heating is probably the biggest reason why we consume energy uh, as individuals in our society and is responsible for over a third of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and what our big challenge is, is to essentially decarbonize uh, all heat in buildings uh, and also in industry. Uh, we are hoping to publish a heat and building strategy later this year that will set out immediate actions that we uh, want to take as a government for reducing emissions uh, from buildings. And I think it will be start also the start of a debate. I think uh, when people talk about hydrogen, eventually it may well be the case that hydrogen can be formed part of, part of the gas distribution network because that network is already there. I was speaking to uh, trade unions uh, earlier today and they were saying that um, one of the trade union leaders was in this space was saying that you know we already have a gas distribution network. And that's something that we can use. Um, and, and essentially the great prize is decarbonizing uh, gas and obviously hydrogen, green hydrogen particularly. Um, but, but, but any but blue hydrogen as well would be part of that story. So lastly, um, I would just say that, I mean, I think while the heat and building strategy is, uh, is a challenging, uh, a challenging um, uh, affair, a challenging set of uh, policies that we need to think up and, and execute, um, I would say that the, you know, in the budget 2020, the Chancellor announced a number of measures to support heat decarbonisation. Um, we've got, again, uh, a new green gas levy, which is going to try and increase the amount of green gas in the grid. Um, and we've announced small uh, amounts, um, which can grow over time uh, to, to um, secure the rollout of heat pumps and also looking at biomass as well. So um, while many people will say, you know, we're not going fast enough, I fully understand why people say that. I think there's been a huge initiative, even in the last year, I would say, 18 months, um, and, a, and a quickening of pace uh, in, this, in this space. And I think that, um, you know, the, 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 um, the agenda, the net zero agenda, is much more widely accepted uh, in society, across uh, businesses, We've seen net zero carbon uh, targets announced by BP, by Shell, by other companies as well. Uh, also in the retail space as well, Sainsbury's. So the world's really moved on very considerably in the last 18 months. And it's in that spirit of um, potential, I think, that I'm very pleased you know, to, to address your, your panel today. Minister, thanks. Thank you very much indeed. And, that, and particularly for the context that uh, I think we all understand some of the timing uh, issues, particularly at the moment with the economic crisis as well as the health crisis we have. And uh, of course we have the uh, COP26 at some point as well. But thank you for uh, offering to ask, uh, to answer questions. I've got, I'd perhaps bring in just three briefly. Um, Chantelle de, de Villiers, um, followed perhaps by um, uh, Clementine uh, Cowton, and if, uh, Howell Lloyd is still here than him. But uh, uh, first of all, uh, Chantelle, would you like to ask a question to the Minister? Are you there? Clementine, while we wait, do, 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 you, do you have a question? I actually didn't have a question, but I'm I, well, I know very happy to, to bring one in if that's... Helpful. Uh, I was, I was um, talking on, on the chat before you joined, Minister, um, with some of the panellists about the um, kind of in, our increasing understanding of, of the potential for consumers to const and, and specifically domestic energy customers to contribute to this changing landscape. Um, I think throughout, well, before the coronavirus crisis, but, in, but also throughout it, we've seen an incredible step change in, in, in the um, responsiveness of people to um, price signals for using energy at different times. And I just wondered what your thoughts are in terms of potentially getting into the white paper, um, some, some kind of strong guidance for Ofgem and, and other areas of, of policy in terms of um, really uh, getting some market um, stimulus behind those, um, behind the kind of uh, price signals. Of flexibility. So 
I, I think, I mean, I think this, you mentioned Ofgem. I think this is something which Ofgem are really, really mindful of. The fact is that, you know, they have to, the institutions have to be right for the net zero transition. Uh, you mentioned um, consumers. I mean, they have to have buy-in as well. There's no way that you can impose such a huge um, change from the top down. Um, you can legislate and you can encourage behavior, but ultimately this has to be done with the consent of the majority of people. But I think actually on that, we're making a huge amount of progress as a country. I don't think, you know, if you compare where we were two years ago, we're in a, we're in a much more advanced place. Now you might say the, 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 the um, you know, the crisis is more urgent now than it was two years ago, which is true. But at least we're bringing more people with us um, than was the case in the past. And ultimately, this is what I've always said in the election campaigns and in and political platforms. This isn't going to work if we just lecture people as to how bad the climate crisis is. And if they don't believe it, then we're at square one. We've got to, we've got to get buy-in from a majority of people who can then change their behavior. And I think that's, I think that's happening. But lecturing and, and, and essentially imposing our view on, on, on the electorate isn't going to work. I, I, I totally agree. And I wonder if as well, as well as um, the kind of wider behavior change on, an, on a kind of moral basis, um, we can be smart in how we use market mechanisms so that, that consumers benefit financially from doing the right thing and using energy at times when there's lots of renewables on the grid. Yeah, I think we can. I think we can make all those arguments. Um, you know, I mean, it was very striking to me in an election. I mean, I, I represent a fairly sort of, well, very, by general standards, conservative seat. Um, you know, I've been elected, I think this is my fourth general election. And this is the first time that climate change actually was an issue raised on the doorstep. So, you know, by people who, they're not eco-warriors, they're not, you know, they see themselves as middle of the road sort of taxpayers. The fact that, you know, in four elections, this is the first time it was raised, I think was a really encouraging sign. Um, it certainly wasn't raised when I was first elected in 2010, um, but, it, but it, was, it was an issue in this, in this general election. I mean, Vera um, raises her eyebrows, but, you know, Spellthorn isn't Bath or whichever seat you represent. I mean, we've got to understand there are 650 seats um, and, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people aren't really as alive to these issues as, as we would like them to be. But actually, this time, um, I was surprised and, and heartened by the fact that it was, it, people were talking about it. Good, thank you. And perhaps I could bring in now Catherine Jackson from WSP. Catherine. Thank you. Um, many of the technologies which we need for net zero energy rely on global collaboration, global supply chains and global economies of scale to be cost effective. How will the UK government target its policies and investment to ensure that we have access to those global technologies in a world which has been affected by global pandemics? Yeah, I think the pandemic issue is really uh, critical. And we've just had a discussion, a subcommittee uh, discussion of cabinet about quarantining. And clearly, you know, there's a huge danger there if you're um, relying on essentially a global supply chain and global expertise, you know, how you marry that with quarantining for 14 days, you know, is a tricky question. All I would say briefly about that is if we look at offshore wind, we have had a real success there, you know, 35% of the capacity, global offshore wind capacity is in the UK. Um, and that was, uh, I think, drawn out or encouraged by the CFD process. I think that's been a hugely successful um, a process. So we have got ways in which we can encourage uh, global investment into the UK. I think it's a challenge to get skills uh, up to that level and to make sure that you know, a lot of the supply chain in terms of manufacturing is, is British based, but we have had some cons uh, success on that. Good, thank you, um, Minister. I have um, perhaps uh, Emily Follis uh, next, and maybe followed as, if you've still got time, Minister, with Lara Jurgens uh, as maybe our two final questions. Yeah, great. Very happy to answer questions. Okay. Emily, are you there? This is the issues with uh, some of these. Uh... <laughs> the technology can be a bit intermittent, like, <laughs> like the renewables. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lara Jurgens, is, is, is Lara there? I have a long list of people that are here. I promise you, Minister, a lot of people. Okay, good. Yes, hi, can you hear me? 
Yeah, yeah I can. Uh, thank thank you. you. Um, what kind of obviously in the in the energy transition and, and moving to um, to net zero, um, is there any kind of support mechanism or support or different programs envisioned for supply chain companies that are looking to transition, make that move, particularly for small and, and medium sized um, enterprises that might already already be struggling in some of the kind of competitive environments that we're seeing in the renewables with the low prices, et cetera. And especially you've already mentioned skills as well um, on increasing the skills building that we might need for um, to transition from different um, uh, industries and bring a lot more uh, cross-sector collaboration to the mix as well? I think there is quite a lot of support. I mean, one of the things, having become a minister in, in the energy, I was struck by, there are so many pots of funding. I mean, there's the Industrial Energy Transformation Fund, there's the Clean Steel Growth Fund, there's the Industrial um, Strategic Challenge Fund. There are lots of different um, pots, if you like. And one of the things that we're trying to do is to bring some of those together. So we've got a, we're trying to create an industrial net zero fund basically that, that encapsulates all of these things so i think there's there's, there's, a, there's an issue of, of, of money there is some support but i think a lot of this um has to be a kind of moral um argument as well well both so you've got the the financial incentives um and also you've got you know the the, the sense in which people feel that they're doing the right thing that that happens and also the fact we've got to create incentives for them to do the right thing as well. So it's not just simply a question of giving cash. You've got to try and work out a tax system where people are encouraged to do the right thing and penalized for, do, for not doing it. And that's, and that's very much the, the government's thinking on, 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 on you know, an approach, a general approach to how we do this. Thank you. I've got um, Howell Lloyd, who is now back with us. Oh, uh, good. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, I touch wood, I won't drop away. So it's a very quick question. Minister, you've talked about uh, you know, the importance of a customer, customer-centric customer view and understanding where they are and what the benefits to them might be. Mm -hmm. um, in a sense, at least part of that with the growth of renewables and the ubiquity of renewables would be to design an energy regulatory system that a couple yes. of times touched on that was much more customer, consumer, and even prosumer focused than the current one. Um, do you think it's either part of your role or uh, perhaps the white paper might be covering it to, to make that much clearer to Ofgem that it should be proactively preparing the energy system to become much more customer -focused? I think that's an excellent, an excellent question. I mean, as far as the white paper is concerned, I'm not revealing, I mean, I've read it lots of times and it keeps changing because the first draft I read was pre-COVID, so we've had to adapt it clearly um, in the light of events. But um, as far as I remember and as far as I, I know, I'm pretty sure that the white paper will say um, that we need to have an institutional refresh, if you like. We need to think about the institutions that are going to deliver uh, net zero. Now, it would be quite wrong for a white paper in 2020 to say exactly what the institutional architecture will look like you know, to deliver net zero, but it's, it's very conscious that we, we have to have that conversation. And I think Ofgem themselves, I mean, I speak to Jonathan Brearley probably twice a week, um, and uh, I think they are, they are conscious of, of how A, COVID will change um, their functions, but more strategically and importantly, how the net zero um, world um, will, will, will change what, what they should be trying to do. And there are other issues with other institutional matters like the ESO, you know, the role of national grid, the role of um, a, an independent system operator, and perhaps not just associated with electricity, all sorts of questions about the, um, about the institutions that we need to deliver, to help deliver net zero. And we're, we're considering everything in that regard. Okay. Good, thank you. Thank you again, uh, Minister. Can I just try to see if we can bring back uh, Emily Follis this time, who uh, I know was trying to get through. Uh, let's see if we, we've sorted. Hello. Hi, hi. Oh, wonderful. Yes, uh, so my question is, um, what are the benefits and on the uh, flip side, what are the um, challenges of- You've been um, mentioned a couple of times, name checked by the minister. Oh, Emily, yes, please come through, yes. Sorry, did you hear the start of my question? No. Yeah, you were saying challenges and successes. The benefits and challenges of um, having a system that provides an element of um, firm power that, that delivers yeah. energy all year round really and precious. challenges of not having that. So some of the modelling we've looked at and I asked for as a minister 
we, we tried to, um, when, when we came in, I, I said that there should be a bit of work, which I described as pathways to 2050. So the way to look at it is if, if, if our world is a big forest and there's a flag in the middle, which is net zero carbon 2050, there are different pathways, right, to getting to the center. There are different energy mixes that can get, it's not, it's not, we can't prescribe the exact path in 2020 to get us to 2050. So we looked at different models. And on that, I think you're gonna to have to have firm power, or dispatchable power. Because one of the, if, if it was entirely done on renewables, one of the issues that you have is, is you've got to have much more capacity if it's all renewable than, than having a layer of, of firm power. It's actually more expensive to rely entirely on renewables for 2050. Um, I mean, now, a government might wish to do that, but I don't, think that's, um, I, do, I don't think that's the most economical way you can get there. I think you've got to have what some people call dispatchable power or firm power as, 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 a, as a base, because I think it just makes it uh, cheaper. The other thing, the other reason why, so there are two other reasons why I think having an energy mix is good. One is security of supply. So you don't want simply just to be relying on one type of technology, because if anything happens to that or, or whatever, then you're in a, you've got a big problem. And secondly, um, in terms of the jobs, in terms of the, the, the base, the, the skills base that you want as a country, you want to have uh, lots of people in these high uh, tech, high um, skilled jobs. And the way to, to do that is to have a very broad uh, mix in terms of energy um, supply and, and generation. Minister, I think we've got time for just one last question, if that's, that's yeah. okay with you. And it's uh, uh, Ashutosh Shastri, who wants to ask about uh, carbon capture use and storage, which you yep. mentioned in your... My favourite subject. Have we... Ashutosh, are you there? You're on my list. Hello, everyone. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, hi. Hi. Uh, very, very interesting comments regarding uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, yeah. And, and regarding your announcement relating to COP26 uh, and the UK sovereign bond, a possible UK sovereign bond. Yeah, possible. I mean, I don't want people no, going exactly. out and but, tweeting but, that we're going to do one you, next you know, week. My, my background really is in, uh, you know, CCUS and natural gas transformation and hydrogen. Yeah. So the board of the Global Gas Center in Geneva. One of the questions which um, I feel passionately about is uh, there is a huge opportunity for the UK, given the number of projects that are already happening in the UK, to create a manufacturing platform for international uh, uh, supply of CCS, which means yeah. a, a capability platform, an industrial architecture platform. And you know, is this something which is, uh, I mean, I don't want you to reveal what is coming up in the energy. Uh, white paper, but is the international dimension um, being considered in, the, in a post-COVID world? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the one, I mean, it's a twofold challenge, really, because on the, on the one hand, you know, we're not, we're not a, we're, we're a strong manufacturing country, but there are other countries like Germany, which have a, a bigger, deeper manufacturing base. So on the one hand, you know, we want to build up manufacturing and industrial capacity in those key technologies. And then once you've done that, you can think of export, okay, in terms of exporting that, th th those products. Because at the moment, our exports are generally services. You know, we've got very skilled engineers. We've got very skilled uh, consultants uh, on offshore wind. But we're not exporting any um, wind turbines. So, I mean, that, that sector just shows the nature of the problem. And I think what we need to do is to build capacity. And we're trying to encourage people to, to build capacity and then uh, at the same time, developing you know, export markets. Because it's only once you've got the capacity and the manufacturing base that you can really talk about, um, think, well, drive exports. We, we have exports now, we export lots of services, but I think in order to enhance that capability, we need to, we need to start building things. And you're quite right that um, the CCUS, um, there is a massive scope for CCUS investment and infrastructure. Um, which we, we, we should be, uh, you know, very, very keen to, to promote. Um, I mean, I speak to people in the oil and gas sector all the time, and there's a lot of infrastructure in the North Sea that we could, be use, we could use or convert to some form of carbon capture and storage, uh, usage and storage. It's not, it's not, you know, the most sophisticated uh, infrastructure. We, we, we can deliver on this, and we should be focused on that. Thank you. Minister, thank you. 
Thanks very much. Well, I've got to go now, apparently. I've got another, yes. another call. But thank you very much. It was a really good discussion. Sorry I couldn't stay longer. No, we really appreciate it. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank indeed. You. And we look forward Take to care. the white paper. No, I look forward to it too. But it's not in my hands. I don't get to decide when it's published. <laughs> I don't thank get to so decide much. when it's published. Anyway, thank you so much. Take okay. care. Thanks, sir. Right, colleagues, that's the, that is the, we, we've come to, really to the end of the session. And um, can I thank particularly our panel as well, uh, Dr. Rebecca Heaton, Professor Bell, uh, Paul Spence, uh, Natasha Mahmoudian, and uh, David Cole for their contributions as well. What I just would remind everybody is that uh, this is one of the uh, beginning of the series around uh, Net Zero. So please uh, tune in to our future events as, as well. Um, but on this one, if you have more evidence or uh, that you wish to put into uh, our all party group, please do that. Send that in by email or whatever to how you've been contacted. And uh, we look forward very much uh, to uh, making contact uh, with you again in the, uh, the rest of the series. But uh, thank you very much indeed. And thank you everybody on the Secretariat for arranging uh, uh, everything uh, so, so well. So keep safe. And uh, from Cornwall, thanks very much indeed for attending and for all the questions as well. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.